uh, I know that we have uh, we have moved ahead on in time a lot, but I believe uh, I believe that God has a word for us. The first service I started on my message, and I had to like stop halfway through, and I told them that I'll continue uh, the next time that I'm preaching. So uh, I want us to uh, I want to tune in today because it's a conversation that we kind of started uh, a week ago uh, on Pentecost Sunday, where we talked about the infilling of the Holy Spirit and what it means for the Christian to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the experience of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, like we talked about last Sunday, happened uh, in the upper room. Uh, in, in Acts chapter number two, we learn about that story where the people, the 120 people came together and they assembled, they prayed, they sought the face of God because the instruction of Jesus to his disciples was do not leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So these same people that were prepared, that were ready, that were passionate, that had, you know, they felt like they were, they were equipped to go out uh, full of passion and strength. They'd seen the resurrected Christ. Jesus still looks at them and says, don't go as yet. Uh, you're not ready as yet. I want you to hold on uh, because there's something more to happen. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit happens where people are charged up. They receive the Holy Spirit. They are infilled with the Holy Spirit. And once they are filled with the Holy Spirit, then they are sent out. And we talked about how important the infilling of the Holy Spirit is to being sent out on mission. Yeah. And uh, I, I kind of want to continue that, that conversation of talking about what that infilling looks like in today's terms. What did that look like in the New Testament church? What does Paul talk about it as far as the infilling of the Holy Spirit is concerned? Uh, there are two parts to it. When the Holy Spirit comes in, we, we had this discussion last Sunday. Uh, upon salvation, or when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God comes and resides within the believer. Along with the Holy Spirit comes the fruit of the Spirit that we have to exercise daily. And I don't have time to go into that today. It's a message for another day. I'll probably do a series on it. But along with that comes the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about today. I want to title my message today, Spiritual Gifts, or also the Gifts of the Spirit. Uh, there is a major uh, confusion in the church world, with a minority of a church world, I would say, in has the gifts of the Spirit ceased? Has the operation of the gifts of the Spirit ceased with the apostles? Uh, is the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the prophecy and the tongues and the interpretation of the tongues and wisdom and knowledge and all of that, has that ceased? And there are other churches that will, or the teachings or a school of thought that will train you and teach you and tell you that some of them have ceased and others haven't. It just uh, it depends upon uh, which church you attend or which ideology you grew up under. For so many people, the understanding that gifts have not ended and have not passed with the apostles are alien to them, and for others, it's not alien, and you understand, like I do, biblically, that the gifts that were present in the New Testament church, that the believers used, and that worked in that benefit for the church growing the way it did, is still very much active today. And if we as believers just tap into it, just exercise those gifts, understand those gifts, realize that we have those gifts, and realize that God can use us through those gifts, you will understand, and I want to open your eyes into the world of possibility where God could use those gifts then for the church to expand. We are living in the end times. And because we're living in the end times, the urgency is then more and more that you and I lean into this understanding that God wants us to be filled in the Holy Spirit. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 4, the Bible says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. 
We are going to spend some time in, in Corinthians, but we'll, we'll also spend some time in other verses in the Bible, and I'll read a lot of verses, so kind of track with me. For those of you who are following in your Bible app, we've made it really easy for you. If you scan the QR code that's coming up, all the notes are uploaded there, and all you need to do is just add your notes to that. So just open up your camera app, scan that, it'll take you to the Bible app, all the notes are on there. For those of you who love doing manual notes and you brought your journal with you, Take your manual notes. This is going to be good. I'm going to teach this morning. Is that okay? I'm going to take a break from preaching. I'll try to, I'll try to preach. I'll try to teach and preach, okay? But I'm, I'm going to try to teach this morning because this is important for us uh, to understand. All right, uh, because I end up saying that I'm going to teach and I end up preaching anyway. So let's just call it preaching today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 4. I give thanks to my God, Paul is saying, always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Jesus Christ. Now, the grace of God, that word grace, someone say grace. That word grace in its original translation, uh, it means, it's the word charis, uh, the word charis, which is the word grace. And the literal meaning of the word charis is a tangible manifestation, a tangible manifestation. Uh, grace is not forgiveness, Grace is not a second chance. Grace does not mean to overlook. The word grace in this context and in this study truly means that there is a tangible manifestation of the workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, if the Holy Spirit is inside of you and if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will always manifest itself within you. It is impossible for the Christian to be filled with the Spirit, yet the Holy Spirit not show in your life. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit has to be manifested, and it is manifested through what the Scriptures will teach us is this word grace or charis or charismata in a few minutes as we will learn. If you go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 33, the Bible says, And with great power, with great power, the apostles were given, giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. It is amazing how as they ministered, they ministered from the overflow of their giftings. There was the manifest presence of God. Rebecca, if you remember during the beginning of the year, as God was teaching us and telling us what his plan for us as a church was, we were thinking and we were praying and we were asking God, God, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to focus on? And God was saying the manifest presence of God. We are getting to the middle of the year and in a month's time or in June, we are actually going to be doing a seven day fasting and prayer. And before, as we step into that, I want us to prepare our hearts to say, God, would you fill us and would you open our eyes to understand what this manifest presence of God means? Some of us need to not be okay with being filled with the Holy Spirit and yet keeping the Holy Spirit inside of us. We should, be, we, should be, we should be excited about the possibility that the Holy Spirit of God has a manifestation that is tangible, that when I do operate in the Spirit, when I pray in the Spirit, when I, when I walk in the Spirit, that which is in me, God has placed within me so that it will be a blessing to the people around me. Here's what I want to let you know. It is a gift not for you. It is a gift for others that God has put within you. That's what a gift is. A gift benefits somebody. A gift is for somebody. But in this case, the gift of the spirit that resides within you, Bino, is not really for you. It's for Jen. It's for Robin. It's for Prince. It's for Nicole. It's for the people that you do community with. And vice versa. The people that are blessed with certain gifts around you, They operate in those gifts, so they allow the Holy Spirit to work in them so that their gift might be a blessing to you. So 
so if all of us collectively lean into this understanding and this idea that God has given us gifts that he expects us to use day after day, and if the church collectively comes together and we all start exercising and using gifts as we should and we must, imagine what is going to happen. The church is going to grow. People are going to grow. Miracles are going to happen. Signs and wonders are going to happen. God is going to grow the church. And when the church grows, nothing can stop it. Barnabas is going to the city of Antioch. In Acts chapter number 11, in verse 23, the Bible says, when he came and saw the grace of God, the charis of God, the tangible manifestation of the spirit of God, the Bible says he was glad and he exhorted them to all remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. He was excited when he saw a church on fire for God. Church, we're not so, supposed to be a church that is just status quo. We're not supposed to be a church that's just checking all some, some boxes here and there, you know, giving to missions here and there, worshiping on a Sunday morning, having a Wednesday service here and there, doing a couple of fasting prayers here and there. No, 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 no. I want to see produce. I want to see fruit. I want to see some men and women that say, I want to produce for God. I want to bear fruit for God so that when I bear fruit, other people around me will come and benefit from the Holy Spirit that is inside of me. Stop withholding. I want to challenge you this morning. Do not be a Christian that withholds the blessing of other people because the Holy Spirit that's within you wants to bless somebody else, but yet you're sitting here and quenching that which the Holy Spirit wants to reveal. And that's why in 1 Peter chapter number four and verse 10, the Bible reminds us this and says, as each of us have received a gift, that word gift is the word charis, charisma, which is grace given gift. It is a gift given through grace. Each of us have received a gift or a gift of the spirit and use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You know what that means? That that grace, those gifts are not just one gift. It's not two gifts. There is a variety of gifts, and that's what we're going to study this morning, is the variety of gifts that God has placed at our disposal, that God looks at us and says, each one of you has a gift. Here's what I want you to look at somebody sitting next to you and say, you have a gift. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, you have a gift. Look at somebody else and say, you have a gift. Man, the, the 11 o'clock is usually noisy. I don't know what's going on with you guys. Some of y'all were partying too late last night. I wonder who y'all are. Oof. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1 says, Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Paul says, man, you have this charismata inside of you. You have this grace. You have the spirit of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit within you. Do not let it go in vain. Do not waste it. And this is where I want to bring you to our passage of scripture today, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now that I've laid a basis for what this really means or what the gifting of the spirit means and why giftings are inside of us, let me then open your eyes into understanding what these gifts are. Y'all ready for this? 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verses one. The Bible says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. We're going to come back to this because this is of vital importance. He starts off with this. In verse number four, he goes, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Someone say varieties of gifts. Varieties. Now we're going to learn of nine gifts that Paul teaches about, okay? There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in everybody. I want to pause there real quick. These nine gifts that we're going to talk about, they're not talents. I don't want you to confuse them with skills. I don't want you to confuse them with, I learned this and I'm really good at this. Please don't confuse. These are not something that you have learned, you have developed, nothing to do with you. The Bible says these are given by God, all right? He, God empowers them in everyone. So you don't maintain it. You don't keep up with it. 
God empowers, which means he gives power. He drives the power through these gifts and he makes you effective in whatever you do when you exercise these gifts. Does that make sense? Verse number seven, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for common good. For to one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. That's point number one, the utterance of wisdom. To another, knowledge. To another, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. Uh, to, to another, gifts of healing by, the, by one spirit. To another, working of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, the Greek word most frequently used, to spiritual, used for spiritual gifts is this word charismata that I was referring to earlier. And it's a word that relates to grace or the charis of God. And concerning these gifts, charismata, Paul is urging the church. And I am urging all of you sitting over here, in verse number one, he says, each of you has given, been, been given this gift, and what I want you to do is I don't want you to be ignorant of these gifts. What does that mean? It's the Father desires that we understand spiritual gifts, that we lean into them with all the power that it possesses. Like I said, like Paul, like like. He, centuries before God revealed to him that man, thousands and thousands of years later, you're going to have churches around Plano and Dallas and the United States arguing if these gifts are still valid or not. So go ahead and tell them before that even happens, I don't want you to be ignorant. Come on, so am I talking to somebody? He's saying, I know y'all are going to fight about this. I know some of y'all are going to be like, ah, I'm going to pick this, 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 because that's, that's pretty good. The other stuff, I haven't experienced it. We haven't experienced it. That's weird. So we're going to just say that the apostles and that was it. Just because you haven't experienced something, it doesn't mean it's from God. It's not from God. Sorry. Am I talking to somebody? Hey, just because you have not had a visual of it, you have not had a tangible expression of it, it does not matter. No one's judging over here. Because the Bible, Paul even says that, to each one is given a gift. So you might have one of these nine, you might have eight of these nine, you might have nine of these nine. Come meet me after service, I need to get prayed by you. Come on somebody. But under no means should you pressure yourself and sit over here and say, Pastor, this doesn't exist. Because I can't do that. Biblically speaking, the Bible says to each one is given a gift. And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Why? Because let me remind you this, church. Remember, the devil's success is dependent upon the Christian's ignorance. When you understand how to stir up these spiritual gifts in your life, you will have power and authority over the enemy that he is afraid of. And as long as he can cause confusion in your mind and questions in your mind and doubts in your mind and say, oh, I don't know if this is right or wrong. Oh, that's weird. Oh, that's weird. He, he'll constantly cause these voices to tell you that maybe if it's weird, it's not from God. But guess what? Open the Bible. The Bible is filled with weird stuff, man. But guess what? It's not weird if you look at it through the eyes of an omniscient God. A God that is sovereign and almighty and all powerful. A God that looks at this universe. There was nothing and he creates everything out of nothing. That is the God that we serve, church. So he says, do not be ignorant. Why? Because the father has provided these gifts to profit his children. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, the Bible says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. I said this earlier. It's not to help yourself. The gift of prophecy within you is not to help yourself. The gift of speaking in tongues is not to help yourself. Any of these gifts, the spirit of wisdom is not, and I'm going to break it down for you and, 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 and tell you why exactly the Bible tells us that. The scripture encourages us to seek the gifts that are available to each of us necessary for our spiritual enrichment. But guess what? It's up to you to identify those gifts. It's up to you to say, Lord, give me those gifts. If you desire it, it's up to you. And let me tell you, th these gifts that we're talking about, it's for the church age. But one day these gifts will cease. 
When Christ comes again to restore the earth to a perfect state, these gifts will be no longer needed. But till that day, you and I as the bride of Christ, we have to use the gifts that God has given us in the spirit to also edify and prepare the other people that also are a part of the bride of Christ to get ready for the bridegroom that is soon coming. So these giftings are not really for you, Vicky. It's to prepare the other people that are supposed to be about the bride and they're not yet on the train. And you and I will use these and must use these and should use these giftings to bring them on this train that we, or they're gonna miss it. I hope you aren't, this, this is kind of understandable. Um, so Paul is inspired in the Holy Spirit and he lists these nine gifts out in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. And we can divide this into three groups, okay? So here's my introduction to these three groups. We can, we can divide them into revelation gifts. We can divide them into vocal gifts and we can divide them into power gifts. Three groups, revelation, vocal, and power. The revelation gifts are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. The vocal gifts are the tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. The power gifts, the third category, is faith, healings, and the working of miracles. I think I got to the interpretation of tongues, and that was it. Uh, for first service, so I might only get till that point, and we might have to continue this message uh, just to kind of keep continuity. But, but if we break these three things up, these three groups up, it's easier to understand these gifts. And although it's not in the same, same order that Paul brings it out, you could kind of categorize these to kind of understand how Paul has categorized them, and it's easier for us to understand, so I've categorized them for you. Let's talk about revelation gifts first. Look at someone and say, wake up. There are three revelation gifts. One is a word of wisdom. Someone say word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's taking what you know or the ability to take what you know and apply it to your life. We have a lot of Christians that know, but that don't do what they know. We have a lot of Christians that have gone through Sunday school. They, they will recite the Bible to you. The, like, it's at the back of that. They know their stuff, but to do the stuff, that's another thing. That's where wisdom comes into being. We experience the word of wisdom when the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural wisdom or understanding through his word in certain situations. That's what wisdom is. You want an example? Remember when Jesus was faced with temptation in the wilderness? And when he ignored what Satan was attempting to offer him, and he responds by quoting the what? The word. The knowledge was there. I shouldn't lean into temptation. But not only did he know that he should not lean into temptation, but he tapped into what he knows, which was the word of God. So he looks at the devil and says what? He says, it is written. It is written. It is written. So not only do I know it, but I'm going to apply it to this particular situation. That is wisdom. When you're faced with situations in your life that's going to make you make some difficult choices and some decisions that you have to make, when the enemy is in your face making you stutter and making you shake in your boots, man, a Christian and a man and a woman of God that is filled with the Spirit and that operates in wisdom does not lean into the vices of the enemy. Rather than doing that, they tap into the Word of God that they know is a lamp unto their feet and they say, it is written, that this and this and this is what the truth is. And because of that, I will tap into wisdom. And because of that, I will be okay. Yes. You know what the opposite of that is? Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's the opposite of wisdom. That's counter wisdom where, where the enemy knew that he could pull her into the seduction of temptation where she fails to confront the devil's lies and she was deceived. You can use the word of wisdom to defeat the purposes of the enemy by knowing how to apply the word. And at times it can mean the difference between life and death. 
I don't know if you've ever been in situations of life and death and somebody had to come to your rescue. And we'll talk about that in a second. But man, for a man and woman of wisdom, you don't even need somebody to come and externally help you. When the word of God has rooted you in ground, the word of wisdom will rescue you and come to you in times of need and pull you out of any situation that you have ever been in. Solomon, when when tasked with the biggest question of his life, man, what do you want? It was not palatial precincts that he asked of God. It wasn't money that he asked of God. He looked at God and said, God, give me wisdom. It's simple, church. The Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask of me. That's what it says. Simply ask. So today we have a task in front of us. One of the biggest blessings and the gifts of the spirit that he puts within us is wisdom. But some of us need to step up and say, God, make me wise. Your wisdom is not connected to the number of gray hair in your head. Otherwise, I would have lots of wisdom. Wisdom is connected to you asking of God and leaning into the the principles of the Lord and leaning into the word of God and saying, God, would you speak to my heart? Would you help me navigate through situations where I need wisdom to kick in? Pray for this gift. Ask God to saturate your life. And as you study the scripture, ask God, Lord, you, Lord, please make this scripture relevant to me in times of distress. I've started doing that. When I study scripture, I just don't study it and then skip it. I ask the Holy Spirit, I pause and say, Holy Spirit, I might need this word tomorrow or next week or two months down the line. Make this relevant to me. Let it be alive in my mind. Let it be alive in my spirit. Let it be alive in my heart. So when I'm faced with temptation, when I'm faced with difficulty, when I'm faced with negativity, I can always go back. Wisdom helps you tap back to knowledge. The second one is the word of knowledge. It's the word of knowledge. Receiving facts supernaturally by the Spirit of God. That's a gift that can only come through the Holy Spirit. What is the word of knowledge? The word of knowledge is something that couldn't possibly be known without the Holy Spirit's prompting. Anybody been there before? That you just had, like, like God tug on your heart and speak to your heart and tell you something that, that, that you didn't know or that somebody else didn't know and, 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 and God told you to go and tell them about it? Like there are numerous examples throughout the scripture where word of knowledge is given by the Holy Spirit concerning a specific problem or or a situation. You know, Elisha that goes up to Gehazi and says, hey dude, what what, what were you up to? You okay there? Gehazi's like trying to stutter and make up some story and he's like, no, I know exactly what you did. You were not supposed to take that money, man. I rejected that money. And yet you went and took what you were not supposed to take. And Elisha confronts him. Why? Because God gives him a supernatural word of knowledge in that moment. Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that moment where they go and confront. They're confronted. They, they, they know what they've done is wrong, but that they, they, they pretended to sell their land and give all to God's work. But Peter receives a word of knowledge that allowed him to boldly ask, man, why did Satan fill your heart and lie to the Holy Spirit? Come on, somebody. A word of knowledge can be personal. It can be given for you to share with others. And when you receive it, remember, you are supposed to edify the body of Christ. Go and share without any, any withholding. It's scary. Anybody ever been in that shoes where you're like, I don't know, Lord, I don't know if this is from you. I don't know if this is from the devil. Man, I I know it's a scary thought. But imagine this. If God has given you a word for somebody, aren't you depriving them of a blessing by holding it to yourself? It call it whatever you want, a sixth sense, a mother's intuition, whatever you want to call it does not matter. But sometimes God gives us and fills us with wisdom, not just wisdom, but a word of knowledge in certain situations where God gives us that ability to know what's going on with certain people. And I'm praying for a word of knowledge over people. I'm praying for the spirit of knowledge over people so that God will reveal things to you for the betterment of other people, to uplift them. I'm praying that over moms and and dads today. I pray that you will know things about your children. I, I pray that God will reveal to you about the struggles your teenagers are going through even before they come and tell it to you so that you could go and sit up to sit, sit, sit with them and talk to them and say, what's going on, baby? Talk to me about this because I know God revealed this to me in my prayer time. 
Like, don't you want to be parents that are filled with the word of knowledge that you don't need people to come and tell you. You don't need teachers to come and tell you. You don't need people to tell you that somebody's being bullied. You can go to the rescue of somebody and give them a word because the Holy Spirit has already given that into you. It's the Holy Spirit's doing. The third point is this, the discerning of the Spirit. The discerning of the Holy Spirit. What is it? It's perceiving the source of a manifestation. Discerning is perceiving, it's perception, it's seeing where or where this this particular thing is coming from. It was the discerning of the spirits that helped the apostle Peter to understand the vision mentioned in Acts chapter 10 that in turn led to the evangelism among Gentiles. For he said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of people. It was the gift of discerning of spirits that led Paul to cast out the evil spirit out of the fortune, fortune teller. Remember that guy that went around saying, I command you in the name of Jesus. Trust me, there are a lot of people around you that will use the name of Jesus. Not everybody that uses, even Jesus said that. You might come up to me and call me by name and say, and in the end, in the end I'm going to look at you and say, I don't know who you are. You need everybody in this room. Can I tell you this? And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You need discernment. Look at the person you and say, you need discernment. Come on, smile at them, nudge them. Say, you need discernment. You need to ask for discernment today when we pray, amen? Because man, we have so much available. As you sit in those chairs, Sunday after Sunday and listen to me preach, you need discernment. Please, I, I am not even joking. I know you trust me with your life, Stanley, but you need discernment. I know you trust every word that comes out of my mouth, but you still need discernment. I do spend a lot of time in prayer and preparation, seeking the face of God to make sure that everything I say and prepare, and I script my messages out, and a lot of people are like, oh, you're you're scripting. No, no, I do that because I want to be as accurate biblically as much as possible. I do that. I take copious amounts of time to do. Why? Because I have to be answerable for everything I say on the day of judgment. I don't want God to look at me and say, I led Beverly astray. I can't do that. But in the same way, I need each one of you to sit there and go back home, take notes and say, let me take every word that was said today and let me use discernment. And that's just not with me, that's with every YouTube person you listen to, every podcast you listen to, every worship song you listen to, every worship leader that you lean into, every emotional wave that you jump onto. Discern. Every trend that you kind of adopt, discern. Every friend that looks like a Christian and a believer, discern. Every business relationship that seems so beautiful and it's a non-negotiable, discern. Every job opportunity that looks like a beauty, God looks and says, discern. Because if God has given you the ability to discern, God looks at you and says in prayer and by the help of the Holy Spirit, for those that are filled with the Spirit, you have the ability. You know what discernment is? The ability to say no sometimes. Let's make the word no cool again in Christian circles. That's what we need. We need discernment. We're in a battle, church. We're in a battle. Can I say we're in a battle? Someone say we're in a battle. We are in a battle and the devil is cunning. Sometimes evil masquerades will be coming against us and they look like good. They look like amazing. It looks like a fruit that you are willing to take and you're willing to eat, but we must be watchful with our supernatural senses, exercising the revelation gift of discernment along with wisdom and knowledge. That's my first category. I'll talk about two more things and I'll close. Is that okay? Just two more and then we'll continue next time. Let's move on to the next part. The next one is vocal gifts. The following are um, the Holy Spirit's three vocal gifts. One is tongues. The church has forever been divided with their understanding of speaking in tongues. I, I want to be very clear with this, and I'm going to teach this as best as I know and I have learned, and I want you to use discernment as well. Is that okay? Can we, can we, can we go through this? This. 
there's some confusion about the first of the vocal gifts because there's actually three kinds or three levels, so to speak, of speaking in tongues. What are they? I'll break it down for you. There's tongues unto God. There's tongues as a sign to the unbeliever. And the third category is the tongues that edify the body of believers. What is the first thing? The tongues unto God. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 14 and verse 2, the Bible says, he that speaks in an unknown tongue. Can we go back, please? He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. Uh, I remember at the age of 13, no one laid hands on me. No one asked me to do anything. I was with a group of young men and we were all uh, just, 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 just praying in the basement of our church. And I just felt a sudden rush of the spirit within me. And I started speaking in, 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 in a language that I did not understand. It wasn't forced on me. It was something that I just started exercising. But it was the gift of the spirit that was just rooted. It was, it was planted inside of me. That I started exercising and, and, the, and the gift of speaking in tongues has never left me since that day. I know friends that are really close to God that really don't have the ability to speak in tongues as yet. They have a close relationship with God and they are not able to speak in tongues. In my personal talk, in my personal prayer time with God, in my personal worship time with God, there are moments that God will give me the ability of the utterance of speaking in tongues. And when, I, when it happens, I speak in tongues, but it's not for anybody else. I speak, that's, it's tongues unto God. The second one is tongues as a sign to the unbeliever. The Bible says in Acts chapter two, some people marveled at hearing their own native tongue. They were like, oh, how are they speaking? Are, they have no idea of this is our language. They, they don't know our language. Like I could count numerous situations where I know people that have walked into indigenous tribes or, and people that they've tried to missionaries that have tried, gone to places and countries and they've just started speaking in their own language without even knowing their language. And, and the people are like, how do you even know our language? And the whole community comes to the saving grace of Jesus Christ because this, the, the missionary just goes and tells them about all the issues that they're going through and how God is going to redeem them from them. And I'm part of communities being baptized and coming to the saving Jesus, grace of Jesus Christ because somebody prophesied in tongues. And that's that. That's the second category. The third one is the tongues that edify the body of believers. I want you to listen carefully. Greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Anybody been in a service where you're worshiping and you're praying or the message is happening and somebody randomly just starts screaming and they just start like, like speaking in tongues? Yes. Okay, you've been there? Okay. He's talking about that situation where if there is an interruption of a church service where somebody will speak in tongues, Paul says, if that is from God, it's for the body. It's for the church, so you pause. So if that happens at Commission Church, I would respect the Holy Spirit and I would pause in that moment and I will allow, if it's from the Holy Spirit, I will allow the Holy Spirit to speak. But here's what's gonna happen. If that is from the Holy Spirit, there will also be an interpretation because all of us need to understand what just happened over there. We need to be prepared for a tornado that's coming tomorrow or a new church building that God's going to give us next week. Or we, we need to know what happened over there, what, what God just spoke to us. Otherwise, there would be confusion, mayhem. Like, so there's three categories of it. And, and forever, the church has just been so, they haven't understood the entirety or the fullness of what this means. And there's been so much of confusion and there's a place for each kind of tongues. I would be amiss if I dismiss these, in, these, these representations and I say, man, this is good. Wisdom is, we need wisdom. We need knowledge. We need discernment. But tongues, eh, just sweep it aside. Prophecy, that's for the Old Testament. No, no, no. I'm not mandating you to speak in tongues. I'm not sticking my finger down your throat and say, speak in tongues right now. No, none of that weird stuff's gonna happen. The, 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 the sad part is weirdness has always been connected with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, and, and you probably might come at me, but pastor, everybody was in the upper room and every one of the 120 people were filled with speaking tongues. Does that mean that everybody has to be filled with speaking tongues? I don't know. That's, that's just an area uh, that I, I have no full answer about, but I truly believe that there are Christians and believers and people that love Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit and shows in their lives and the fruit of the Spirit is so evident in their life and they can't speak in tongues and they've tried and they've asked God and you haven't. And, and all my explanation goes back to is what the Bible says and saying each one will be given a gift so maybe that wasn't your gift maybe if you pray and if you seek the face of God and if that's something that you yearn and you desire like I did maybe if that's a true desire inside of you maybe you will I had somebody come up to me after service last Sunday. We didn't do anything. I just had people raise their palms out and say Holy Spirit fill me and somebody got filled with speaking I'm like I didn't even pray for that See, that's how the whole, because that's God sent. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. But none of us in this room, I don't think we should ever look and say, God, that's not possible, or that can never happen in church. Or, that's a weird church. No, 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 That's a spirit-filled church. And we don't apologize for that. Just like I have studied the word and I am preaching the word, we're a Bible-based church, but yet we're a spirit-filled church. And what that means is we will lean into allowing the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit me- means to do. And sometimes we don't need to understand it. I don't have to understand it. I'm okay with that. Cool? So rise up to your feet. I told you I'm going to teach today. I'm not going to preach. I tried. The the last part, the, the interpretation of the tongues is just what I talked about. The fifth part is the interpretation of tongues. I will be sensitive to it because I believe that interpretation of tongues is connected a lot to prophecy. It is, it is intertwined. It is very, very intertwined. Because the interpretation of tongues oftentimes is for the general uh, benefit of a community, of, of believers in general. I will never dismiss it. If it happens in our church, which I want every one of these gifts to be manifested within our church, but I also desire that it is not manufactured I will refuse, I, I, I will fight with everything I have against manufactured, pres- uh, manufactured presence of God. Every person that walks into this building says, we feel the presence of God. You know why? Because it is organic. It's natural. It's already here. There are people praying during the week. There are people preparing and people walk into this building and they can experience God, not because we're manufacturing something over here, but because the presence of God is already here. We're just walking into it. We're just walking into it. You know why the anointing flows so powerfully when the worship team's up here leading worship? When Jenny's up here and when Prince is up here and when all of these, Nicole and, and all of these, Alyssa and, 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 and Janice and all of them are up here leading worship and they're on the drums and on the keys and on the, they're up, it's not them. Y'all, it's not them. I'm glad they are skilled and I'm glad we have an awesome worship team. Y'all, I am so glad we do. It's not them. Do you know how much time these guys spend in prayer? Do you know how much time these guys spend away from their families just spending time in the presence of God preparing for a nine o'clock service and an 11 o'clock service? Seeking the face of God saying, God, we wanna see you move. Not only are they rehearsing and practicing, they're also spending time in the presence of God saying, God, we want to see you move. We want to see your presence in this place. Yo, I'm, I don't want our church to be just another church. I don't. If somebody was to call us weird, let them call us weird. I care less. What I care really is about God's spirit moving here in a very tangible way. I, and I want you to hear my heart on this. I want, to see real, I want to see people walking out of this building with lives changed and transformed. I really do, but I don't think we can unless every person in this room leans in, like the 120 le- leaned in and said, we want to experience the infilling and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And I need, I need your help here. I need all of us to come into this and say, we, we want to experience this, not just for ourselves, but we want to experience this for the church, capital C, church. Not for commission, 
lowercase church for capital C church because unless the bride is ready, unless we are ready, and the only way we can be ready is all of us are equipped, each one of us, if we are equipped. So here's what I'm gonna do. I, I told the worship team in the first, they're, they're on standby, but I told them, hey, I may call you up, I may not call you up. And we're gonna do stuff differently today. Is that okay? I'm just gonna spend some time in prayer. I usually have the worship team come up here and we have a song, we, we, we do a session of worship. I dismiss people that need to leave, leave, and then people stay. But I'm just going to, I'm just gonna ask us to pray. Is that okay? Can we just spend some time in prayer? Here's what we're gonna pray for. Here's what I, I'm gonna ask you to pray for these things. One, if, if your mind is, is unable to comprehend and understand what the gifting of the Holy Spirit is, ask God for wisdom, ask God for clarity. I want you to pray for clarity right now. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to pray and say, God, would you fill me? If you understand the giftings of what I taught today, if you understand the importance of it, just open your palms out like we did last Sunday. This is what we're gonna do. If you wanna raise your hands, you can raise your hands. If you wanna open your palms out, do something, something that's, that's, that's a, a response, just shows your response. Say, God, would you fill me? Whether that be to be submitted in the presence of God, whether that be to open your heart up to God, I don't know what it is. I want you to ask God for clarity. Say, God, would you speak to me and give me discernment this week? Or if any one of those gifts that we talked about, you're looking and saying, Pastor, I need that. I want that. I want that today. I want that this week. I lack that. You've been making some terrible decisions lately. Your financial decisions have been whack. God says, ask for wisdom and I'll give it to you. You haven't been able to judge between right and wrong. Like the people that have walked into your life, you're like, man, I wish I had better discernment. Ask for discernment right now. He's able to give it to you. Watch when you ask, when you pray, when you seek the face of God, watch how your discernment just goes through the roof. Just don't ask and forget about it today though. Keep asking. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Ask God in fasting. Ask God in prayer. As God gives it to you, practice it, exercise it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So here's what I'm gonna ask you, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm not gonna have music and drums and all of that. I'm gonna ask Robin to just continue playing on the keys. And I believe that it's not a manufactured presence. It's not a manufactured emotion that's in this room. I believe in my heart that if God wants to fill you up, he will fill you up today. So here's what I'm going to do as I do every Sunday. I'm going to pray. I'm going to dismiss. But please, if you need to be filled in the Holy Spirit, do something about it. If you want to just stay in your seats, stand where you are. You're welcome to. If you want to kneel down, you can. If you want to just come down to the altar and just isolate yourself for a few minutes, you're welcome to do that as well. Nothing's weird. Nothing's crazy. No one's going to do anything weird. It's just a time between you and the Lord. If you need to look at God and say, God, I've, I've, I've ran away too much or I've subdued this too much, I've quenched this too much, not anymore. I want to release this. I want to operate in the overflow of your gifting. Come to him today. Come to him. Come to him. He says, come to me all who are hungry and thirsty and I will fill you up. Those who lack wisdom, ask of me and I will give it to you. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. I'm gonna pray and dismiss you. If you need to be dismissed, you can. If you wanna linger in the presence of God, you can. And as and when the Holy Spirit releases you, you're welcome to leave. But Father, we thank you for this moment. Holy Spirit of the living God, we thank you for what you've done in this place and what you continue to do in this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you for filling us. Thank you for instilling within us and filling us with the Holy Spirit that is so powerful and mighty. And I believe in my heart, God, that you are going to do wonders, signs, and miracles in these coming days. I cannot wait to teach everybody about the signs and wonders and miracles and and, and the creation power of God and prophecy. I cannot wait, God, to teach them about that in the following Sundays. Father, I pray for our church that we will be a church that is spirit-filled, 
not just on paper, not just something we say, but in truth. I pray that we will be men and women that are driven by the Spirit, that are led by the Spirit, that, that, that can know between right and wrong, that have huge discernment, God, that are filled with wisdom and knowledge. And Father, if you wish to fill us with, your, with the Spirit of speaking in tongues, I pray, God, that that gift will be, will, will be distributed in this building right now as I pray in the name of Jesus. And I pray for the interpretation of tongues. If you have a word for us in this season, would you give us that word? We're open. We're open. Fill us. In Jesus' name, church, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance your direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.